Go ahead and take out your Bibles this morning. Turn to the book of John, chapter number 20. John, chapter number 20. Over the last few weeks, we've seen really the worst parts of Scripture, if you could. I mean, there's some of the the, the worst imagery, the worst things we could talk about in, in witnessing the torture and then the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And, and as awful, as terrible, as horrible as the crucifixion is, and as, as horrible as it is to witness that and to talk about the details of that, even as awful as that is, even more blessed is the resurrection, which is what we're going to talk about this morning. So yes, we, we, we've witnessed the torture, we've witnessed the crucifixion, and, and how our hearts break when we see that. But then we get to John chapter 20 and we witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and our hearts should burst with joy as we consider that he, he didn't stay in the grave, he rose again. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today, and it's a joyous thing. And it, it's interesting because we've been doing this study through the book of John, that this is where we are right now, it, it, over a year year or so, a year and a month and a half we've been in John, and now we're at the resurrection. And you know what? In about a month and a half, we're coming back again because it'll be time for Easter. Uh, so we get to hear about the resurrection, which we reference throughout the year, but really when it comes to resurrection sermons, talking about the risen Savior, it's really Easter. That's, that's when we focus on it. And so we're getting a, a double dose within about a two-month period where we'll talk about the resurrection today, and then we'll talk about it again in April for Easter. Uh, but this morning, the title of the message, it's a simple one, uh, a super simple message, and it's this, risen, risen, super simple. Jesus is risen. It, we could, I mean, honestly, all those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, we could stop right here and we could just, we could have a time of celebration that Jesus is risen. We serve a risen Savior. We don't serve someone who died, was in the tomb, and then they were just left there. And we're without hope. No, we serve a risen Savior. And so we could spend quite a while just celebrating that. We, we could say as the Gospels, he is risen from the dead. He is risen as he said. Uh, the, the hymn writer Charles Wesley put it this way. In Christ the Lord is risen today. He said, Christ the Lord is risen today. Earth and heaven and chorus say, raise your joys and triumphs high. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Love's redeeming work is done, fought the fight, the battle won. Death in vain forbids him rise. Christ has opened paradise. Lives again our glorious King. Where, O oh death, is now thy sting? Once he died, our souls to save. Where's the victory, boasting grave? You see, Jesus rose from the dead. He defeated the grave. He defeated death. He defeated sin. And what a joy it is that we get to talk about that this morning. Now, before we continue, perhaps just, uh, I have no idea. There's, there's some folks that I don't know your background. I don't know if maybe today's your first time walking into church, or maybe it's your first time in a long time, or maybe it's your first time being in a church that preaches the Bible. Maybe, I, there's, there's no idea. So I don't want to make an assumption that you know what we're talking about. So before we talk about the resurrection, I just want to tell you why the resurrection even had to happen, why it was necessary. You see, the Bible tells us that God loved mankind so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that he could die in mankind's place. But why? Why would someone need to die for us? As we go all the way back to the beginning, just about to Genesis chapter 3, we read that man and woman chose sin. They chose rebellion against God rather than that close walk and fellowship with him. And for uh, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. It's punishment. Sin must be punished. God cannot allow sinful man into his presence as he is perfect, he is holy, he is just. But rather than just saying, well, I'm done with mankind then. They sinned, I'm done, I'm just going to wipe the slate clean, I'll start over. Instead, God says, I'm going to make a way to where they can be redeemed unto me. They can be brought back in right fellowship with me. But there's only one way, and their sin has to be punished. Now, if you and I chose to pay for our sin, and we'll just, I'll just serve my own punishment. I'll just take, it, take, take a sentence for myself, and I'll, I'll serve this out. The punishment is eternity separated from God. It is an eternal death, eternal punishment separated from God. Now, you and I will never be able to pay that sin and then be reunited with God. So God said, here's what I'll do. I'll give the one perfect sinless sacrifice to take care of all of mankind's sin. And that one sinless sacrifice was his son, Jesus Christ. So he gave his son, Jesus, born of a virgin, uh, to the Virgin Mary. 
Mary. We read about it in Luke chapters 1 and 2. Uh, and this is what we celebrate at Christmas. He was born to Mary there in Bethlehem. Then Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, the Bible tells us, and at the age of 30, he began his earthly ministry. During this earthly ministry, he would teach, he would preach, he would work miracles, and constantly he was pointing everyone to himself as the only way to the Father. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so Jesus lived this perfect, sinless life. He did all these great things. He, he, he showed people the way to the Father. Here's how you can be redeemed. How you can be saved is what we say. How you can be saved and have a home in heaven for all eternity. But there were some religious rulers of his day that they had their own ideas. And they had their way that they wanted people to behave. And they had their way that they wanted people to, to do everything that they were supposed to do. And so when Jesus came preaching that I am the way, the truth, and the life, those religious rulers, they didn't like it. And so they began early on in his ministry to conspire how they might trip up Jesus. Constantly, we'll see that. They asked questions to trap him. They asked questions to trip him up. They tried to trick him. They tried to get him to say something that would allow them to arrest him. And they couldn't find anything. And then eventually, as we saw a number of weeks ago in the book of John, one of his own disciples betrayed him to them. Things weren't happening as fast as he would have liked or in the way that he would have liked. So he said, hey, I'll tell you where he's going to be, when he's going to be there, and I'll, I'll even take you to him. So Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. And then Jesus was arrested. He was put on trial. The trial was a mockery of the justice system. There, was, there were witnesses. No two witnesses could agree. They had people making up stories. And finally, they're just like, we'll just take whatever. And they tried Jesus, and he was found guilty. And that's a very shortened synopsis of what happened. But Pilate, the Roman, uh, if you will, kind of governor, ruler of the area over that area of Israel, Pilate had him scourged. This was beaten. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. He was beaten so, so badly that Jesus didn't even appear human anymore. He was just, he was just a mess. We remember in Isaiah 53 how it said, by his stripes we are healed. Because of his suffering and his bleeding, we can be healed of our sin problem. And so we saw that Jesus was tortured. And then Pilate brings Jesus before the people. And he's like, surely this is enough. I've beaten him. He's, he's beaten. He's bloodied. I mean, any lesson you wanted him to learn, I'm sure he's learned it now. It's time to release him. I don't find any reason to keep him. And they said, no, we want him crucified. We want him dead. So then last week we talked about the crucifixion. Jesus willingly went to the cross. The cross is not some cute little image. It's not something we just put on a t-shirt. It's not a pair of earrings or a necklace. It's not something that we hang in our houses. The cross that Jesus hung on was rough. It was horrible. It, it was a torture device. It was one of the most brutal forms of, of death. And our Savior went to the cross willingly. He allowed himself to be nailed to that cross. He died on that cross and was buried. And that's where we left off last week at the tomb. But this morning, we're going to see Jesus risen. John chapter number 20 this morning. Let's look at the first 23 verses. The Bible says this. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher. And seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came, uh, which came first to the sepulcher and he saw and believed for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the, 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 then the disciples went away again into their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. 
Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabbani, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Then when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Can you imagine... What those few days after the crucifixion must have been like. Can you imagine the despair that the disciples felt? Jesus had foretold in the upper room at the Last Supper, he said, when I'm arrested, when I'm taken away, all of you will be offended at me. All of you will scatter. And remember, this prompted Peter to say, not me, Lord, though all these others leave you, though all these others scatter, though all these others forsake you, I will never do that, Lord. I will be with you even if it means I have to die. That's what Peter said. But Jesus said, all of you will scatter. And so a few hours after that statement in the garden, Whenever the, 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 the high priest and, and his soldiers and different ones come to arrest Jesus, what happens to the disciples? They scatter. They all go to different directions. So it's something after the death of Jesus, we know they came back together because we read it just then that they were all together in a room. Can you imagine what those few days must have been like? Imagine, if you will, the, the, the word starts to spread. Jesus has died on the cross. He's dead. He's been buried. And word starts to spread, and maybe, I don't know, maybe the disciples, maybe they had a particular location. If anything ever happens, if we ever get separated, meet back at this place. You know, meet back here first thing the next morning. Meet back here, middle of the night, I don't know. But somehow they all knew to come back together. Because as we read there later in our passage, they were all together in a room. Can you imagine what those couple days must have been like? Think about the worst funeral service you've ever been in or the one that you heard about and and how there was just weeping and just this, 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 this sound of just mourning and sorrow. I imagine it was something like that. I imagine as the disciples are together and and the ladies that were there and and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene and the others, they've they've come to this place. This is where we're supposed to meet. So the disciples are there. and It wasn't just 11 people plus a couple of the ladies. I'm sure there was a crowd had gathered. And and as they're there, they're weeping, they're they're mourning, they're wailing as their custom that day was when they were very, very loud mourning. And so imagine that happening. And so they're, they're, they're mourning, and, and, and imagine, uh, in my mind, I see them hugging each other and just basically hugging because they're trying to hold each other up. They just, everything, every bit of strength they have is gone because this, this is the Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is everything he said, everything he did. How can he be dead? So imagine those disciples and others that are gathered in that room. Just the immense sorrow and the immense pain that they felt. You know, Jesus had been preparing them for this moment. I mean, he had told them numerous times throughout the Gospels we read, numerous times, I'm going to be taken. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to die. And on the third day, I'll rise again. Just like Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days, so will I be in the, in the middle of the earth. And then I'll rise again. Uh, he told him of his death. Remember when he talked to Nicodemus, he said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, signifying by what death he was to die. 
He had been telling them over and over again, this is going to happen. But somehow the disciples didn't get it. They grabbed a hold of all kinds of things he said. There were many things that he said to them that they latched onto. They understood. They internalized it. They made it part of their lives. But somehow they missed, I'm coming again. Like not, I'm coming again a long time from now. But I'm going to rise from the dead. They're going to kill me. And in three days, I will come again. But somehow they missed this. You know, something I wonder, and this is just a side note here, side thought. When those disciples were gathered together, I wonder if any of them knew that Peter had denied Jesus. Or is that just something he was bearing on his own? And we'll see later in the next chapter that interaction, Peter and Jesus. And I'm, I imagine some immense pain that Peter was feeling when he considered he had denied Jesus. And so they're in this room all gathered mourning and maybe Peter was mourning a little more than the others. And they just thought, well, it's because he was one of his closest, not knowing Peter had just denied him a few hours before. As we think about this, as we think about all that Jesus had said to them, we think about them gathered together in that room because they, as far as they knew, the cross was the end. You and I have the benefit of having all of Scripture before us. We have the Bible. So we don't just have to be like the disciples and in that moment and saying, well, what happens next? Jesus is dead. Now what? We have the benefit of all of Scripture, so we, we can go ahead and jump ahead, and we know what happens. But they were living it. So before we're too hard on the disciples, they were in the moment living that right then. If you've ever had a situation in your life where you've said, God, I just don't know what's going on, and I don't understand, and why aren't you here, and why haven't you shown me the way, and why haven't you told me what's going to happen next? Okay, that, that feeling that you have, that's just a little bit of what the disciples were feeling whenever they found out that Jesus was dead. And so he was dead, but praise the Lord, he is risen. As we consider John chapter 20 and these first 23 verses, there's a few things that I want to draw out for you as you look at this passage. The first thing I want us to see from very early there in the passage, I want us to see the empty tomb. The empty tomb. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb early the first day of the week, early in the morning, still dark outside, but she came to the tomb. One of the other gospel writers says that it was a group of ladies came to the tomb. It wasn't Mary by herself. Again, each gospel writer kind of, they, they tell their own detail that they remember or something that's fresh on their mind or an angle that they're giving. And I've, I've mentioned this before. If four of us saw an accident over here at 83 and 181, if four of us were standing on the four corners and we saw the same accident and a police officer came and interviewed each of us and said, okay, what did you see? What happened? Each of us are going to speak to what we saw based on certain things about our character. I've, I've said this before. If John Tolson were out there, he would say, well, it was a 1976, blah, blah, blah. The engine was probably this based on the sound. Uh, and, and he was going about this fast. You see, there's certain things that he would notice that I wouldn't necessarily notice. Wes, being a, a firefighter and, and having background in paramedics and stuff, he's going to be thinking a different direction than, than Brother Danny would or than I would. But we would all see the same thing. We would all describe the same accident, but we would all be bringing forth different details based on our own experience, based on the angle we saw it from, based on any number of things. So when we read the gospel writers and you say, well, John said Mary showed up and, and, and the other writers say the group of ladies came. And why is it different? It's one person telling their perspective from the angle, from the experience that they were speaking. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit said, tell your story. Tell it the way that you saw it, and, and, and I'll help you. And so Mary Magdalene shows up early that morning, and what does she find? Remember, they've been mourning all weekend. Jesus died on the cross a few days before, and when she shows up, she expects to go to the tomb. It says in another passage, the ladies had come, they had brought spices and ointments, because 
in, in the Jewish preparation of a body before it was uh, put into the tomb, it was wrapped, it was, it was uh, uh, different uh, ointments and spices were applied to the body, and, and, and all of this happened before burial. But if you recall, when we looked at the crucifixion, it says they removed Jesus quickly from the cross because of the, 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 the Sabbath, the high Sabbath was coming. They had to get him off the cross in the tomb, tomb sealed quickly. So there was no time to anoint the body. There was no time to give it the proper treatment. So Mary and the other ladies came. The first day of the week after the Sabbath was over, after all of that, they came the first day of the week and they were going to take care of anointing the body. But when they showed up, specifically John talks about when Mary Magdalene shows up, immediately she struck, something's wrong. You ever show up somewhere, you ever walk into a room, or you ever show up at home and Something just seems off. And you, you can't put your finger on it right away. You know something's off. Maybe it's a smell. Maybe it's a sound. Something's off. And so you stop. Maybe you tell everyone, stand, stand still, stand still. Something, something doesn't seem right. What, what's, what's different? Mary shows up to the tomb and something's off. And it doesn't take long to figure out what it is. The stone has been rolled away. And in that moment, we don't hear that she did much except she saw, once she figured out the stone is rolled away, she ran back to get the disciples. That empty tomb, something was different than it had been the, the days before. Something was going on. I mean, consider the empty tomb. This is on the third day. They knew for two days it hadn't been empty. They witnessed Jesus taken off the cross by Joseph of Arimathea and by Nicodemus. They witnessed his body wrapped because they did that much. They weren't able to do all the anointing and everything, but at least they wrapped the body. They witnessed them taking Jesus' body, placing it in the tomb, and a stone rolled into place. And maybe, because of the Sabbath, they couldn't do any work, so they couldn't come and anoint the body, but maybe... Maybe they were close enough that they could still be within their, the law of the day. And, you know, because the, the Sabbath was very serious and the law said you could only walk a certain number of steps on the Sabbath. And it was very restricted what you could do on the Sabbath so that you didn't accidentally enter into doing work because you weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. But maybe they were close enough that maybe on the first day they went by and just prayed or just saw the tomb and wept. Maybe on the second day they did the same thing. And so they knew the tomb is sealed. Jesus is, is inside and, and all hope is lost. But when Mary and the others showed up on the third day, something was different because the tomb was empty. It, it had been full for the previous two days, but now it was empty. Can you imagine showing up to that tomb talking about something being off? We've got a cemetery behind us. If you, maybe you have family members that have been buried back there, and maybe from time to time you go and visit the gravesite, and maybe you lay flowers. It, 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 talk about a shock to your system. What if you went there tomorrow, early? I've got to go to work, but I just want to go by the cemetery early in the morning. The sun's barely peeking up over the trees. I'm pointing them. I don't even know which direction is the right direction. But anyway, they're peeking up over the trees. And you go out to the cemetery, and you're getting ready to lay your flowers there, and there's a big hole right there and there's no casket in there it's just the big hole i'm going to go out on a limb and i'm going to say that you're probably going to think hmm something's not right here okay that's just i mean that's a very understated way of saying what you're probably going to be thinking and feeling okay like, you know when i came by the other day there was not a hole here i think something has happened can you imagine I mean, for two days they came if, if they came by the, the tomb sealed jesus is in there and now they show up and it's, the stone is rolled away. Not, not only do we see, I mean, it had, Jesus had been in there for two days, but then also the, the tomb had been sealed and guarded. We read that uh, the high priest and the Pharisees, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they, they came to Pilate. After Pilate was taken down off the cross and put in the tomb, they came to Pilate and they said, this Jesus, he, he was preaching and he said, that if he died on the third day, he would come out of that grave alive. And we don't want his followers to come to this grave, move the stone, take his body out, put the stone back, and then tell everyone, you know what, Jesus rose. He's not in there anymore. Go check. Because so, then they'll just start spreading rumors, and they'll, they, they, people are going to be led away by this false teaching. So, so Pilate, what we want you to do, we want you to put a guard there at the tomb. And so Pilate says, fine, do it. 
So the stone was in place. They sealed it, meaning there was some way, you know, uh, they placed a seal, they, they wax or whatever to show that it has not been opened. It is closed. It hasn't been opened since it was closed. The seal is still affixed. Uh, and, and you know what? I'll put guards out there too. These would have been Roman soldiers. Me, these are going to be men's men. These were not going to be some wimps that would be beaten by fishermen and a tax collector. Like these guys were the real deal. There's no way the disciples or the women that followed Jesus were going to be able to overpower the Roman soldiers to get Jesus' body out of the tomb. And so when Mary arrives and the, the stone is rolled back, hey, yesterday and the day before, there were a group of soldiers out here. We couldn't even get close to the tomb because of them. When, when we wanted to mourn, when we wanted to pray, we had to stay at a distance because of the Roman soldiers. So she knew something's different today because the stone's rolled away and the soldiers aren't hanging around anymore. They're not guarding. So, so what's happened? But then also, it's also key, not only the two previous days, the, the tomb had been full, Jesus had been in it, uh, not only had there been uh, soldiers guarding it and it had a seal on it, not only that, but here's something key, it was when she approached, it was the third day since Jesus had died. It was the third day since Jesus had died, and that was significant. And, and you know, something I noticed whenever I talked about the, the chief priests and the Pharisees said, this Jesus said, he would die, and on the third day, he would raise from the dead. They understood something that seemed to elude the disciples. The disciples who were with Jesus all day, every day, he had taught them in public, they had heard him say this. They had heard him say this in private, and they still, in their mourning, and their weeping, and everything that was going on, they didn't recognize this is the third day, Jesus should be coming out now. They, they didn't recognize that. But the chief priests and the Pharisees said, wait a second, third day. Uh, we we got to guard it because on the third day, he said he was going to raise him, so his disciples will probably come get him. No, they weren't coming to get him. They had already given up hope. But it was the third day when Mary approached. You know, I've heard it said over time uh, that more, you know, a lot of times we associate the cross. That's like the symbol of Christianity. I've heard it said that the empty tomb should be the symbol of Christianity. You know, the cross, Jesus died. You know, a lot of people have died. Even in their day, a lot of people were crucified. But there was only one who got himself up after that and walked out of the tomb. And so we see the empty tomb. First thing we notice in chapter 20 is the empty tomb. But here's something else we see. We see the confused disciples. I mean, as we read our text, we, we see the empty tomb, but then we see the disciples as they approach the tomb. And just for simplicity's sake, I'll just say the disciples, meaning all of Jesus' followers that came, including Mary Magdalene, the ladies, Peter, and that disciple. We'll talk about that disciple in just a second. Um, but, but just for simplicity's sake, the disciples, they were all confused. All of Jesus' followers, then, they were confused. What happened to the stone? Where's the body? Where's Jesus? What's going on? We don't know what's happening. They were confused. Again, this is just more evidence that they never truly understood what Jesus had been telling them. Here's what's going to happen, guys. I'll be arrested. I will die. And on the third day, I'll rise again. And they approach the thing. They approach the tomb like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. It's the third day since he died. What happened? Where is he? I mean, can you imagine if they truly understood what, what, what the third day meant and what Jesus was saying? If they truly understood what was happening, they wouldn't have been confused by it. Rather, they'd have been like, like you on, on New Year's Eve. Like they'd have been counting down the minutes. It's almost midnight. Third day's about to hit. Ready, everybody? Ten. Nine. They would, they'd have been waiting for Jesus. They'd have been ready. They wouldn't have been sorrowing. They wouldn't have been scared. They wouldn't have been hiding out like, here it is. It's about to happen. They would have been at the tomb. They'd have been waiting. So forget the ball drop. They'd have been waiting for the stone roll. And they'd been out there, 10, 9. They'd been waiting for Jesus to come out if they had truly understood what he had been saying. But they didn't. They were confused. They had their doubts. We talk about doubting Thomas, but they all had their doubts. They all had doubts. They all had confusion. In our text, John tells us that Mary Magdalene found the tomb, went and told the others. And in response to the news, Peter and that other disciple ran to the tomb. We've been in the book of John for a while. And pop quiz, who was the other disciple? It's John. Because in the book of John, he never calls himself John. He refers to himself as that other disciple. Or my favorite one, the disciple that Jesus loved. You know? That's like your children saying, you know, well, I mean, 
We all know who mom's favorite is. <laughs> it's me. Everyone knows. I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> right here. Okay? That's John. John's like the one that Jesus loved above all the other disciples right here. And so that's what he says. In this passage, he never says, I was there and I ran and Peter ran. and we. He just says that other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. Mary goes and tells them and they come running to the tomb. John says that he reached the tomb first. I don't know if that's a little... You know, I can't wait till Peter reads this. You remember how I beat you there? Because you were so slow and I was so fast. Because, you know, you think about sometimes you, maybe a, a, an Easter play or something, you, you see this like the sons of thunder, James and John, and you see Peter and Andrew over here, and they're all fishermen, and there was this friendly competition. There was this, you know, uh, I'll bet we'll catch more fish today than you. No, we'll do. And so you imagine there was that camaraderie and that rivalry there. So John putting in there, you know, I got there first. Remember that? I mean, we went to the zoo and I got there first. But then Peter's like, oh, you got there first, but who went in? That was me, right? Like, I, you stopped at the door. I kept going. So really, I mean, what was the finish line? Was it the door or was it inside the tomb? Because it was inside the tomb. I won. You stopped. You quit. Yeah, so, so they both ran to the tomb. John gets there and he looks in. There's some things we don't know for sure, but he looks in and he saw the grave clothes. It's been suggested that perhaps when Jesus rose, the grave clothes kept their shape. So he rose out of the clothes, these, the, the wrappings. You know, just a crude illustration. If you think about a mummy, like in Egypt, those mummies, how they're wrapped. Think about that. Their bodies were wrapped. And so instead of, uh, it, the idea is that Jesus came out of those wrappings, but left the wrappings where they were. So John gets there and he looks in, and perhaps those wrappings still had the form of a body. And he looks in and he's like, what was Mary talking about? Yeah, the stones rolled away, but he's right there. Peter didn't stop, though. I mean, remember all that Peter's done in the last few hours. Again, this is the last few days. He, he's, he knows he's got stuff to make up for. He's ashamed. He's like, if I get another chance, if I can have another chance to see Jesus and talk to Jesus and make things right with Jesus. And so he doesn't stop at the door. Peter goes all the way in. And what Peter finds is, see, at the time when they would wrap the body, the face it would, have its, it would have its own napkin, you know, like a, like a handkerchief. And they would place that over the face. And when Jesus rose, the napkin was taken and folded and set to the side. So let's say those grave clothes maintained the shape of a body. Peter didn't stop at the foot and say, yep, it's, it's a body. I don't know what Mary's talking about. He went in and he took a look. He, he actually examined. He inspected he started, he was like a detective, looking at the crime scene, seeing what had happened. And when he got to the head, there was no face there. Can you imagine Peter looking at it and looking around and then maybe leaning down and looking into the cavity of those grave clothes? Well, they empty. He ain't there. And John comes in at that point and he's like, what, what's going on? He's like, I, I, see, I see him. I see the body. Peter, can you imagine Peter? Oh, I don't think you do. <laughs> Come here, buddy boy. Take a look at that. Now, you and I would think, that's still the deal for him right there. Man, as a matter of fact, the Bible says right there. Uh, let's see, where is it? It, it? The other disciple, verse number 9, no, verse number 8. It says, then went in that other disciple, which came, to the first, came first to the sepulcher. We would just say John. Then came John, and he saw and believed. So it seems like, oh, he, he, Jesus has risen, everything's great, yippee, all right, everything's fantastic. I would submit that he didn't believe that Jesus had raised from the dead yet. Because what would he have done? What do you think he would have done if he thought Jesus had just risen from the dead? He's going to tell everybody he knows. He's going to tell everybody he sees on the way to see the people he knows. He's going to get up on the rooftops and shout it. They're going to search high and low to find Jesus so they can worship at his feet. But what does verse number 9 tell us they did? Then the disciples went away again into their own home. That doesn't sound like someone that, that just witnessed that Jesus has raised from the dead. That, that, what, that, what have they believed? What was the story they've been told? Mary said they've taken Jesus and they came, John first looks, no, he's still there. Peter, Peter comes over and goes, he's not. He's just grateful. I don't know how they did it. But they made it look like Jesus was still here. The clothes still have the shape of the body, but there's, there's no body in there. I don't know how they did it. I mean, this is, this is a big, I, I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on. And so they left confused. 
Peter and John went home. That's not the people that believe. Matter of fact, the verse, verse number uh, 9 says, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't get it. They still didn't get it. That was Peter and John. But then <clears throat> we see, if we were to jump ahead to verse 20, this is another proof that I don't think in verse number 8 and 9 they got it. Verse 20, it says, And when he had so said, when Jesus appeared to them, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. It wasn't at the tomb when they saw the empty clothes. It was when they saw the Lord, then were they glad. So they still had doubts even seeing the empty tomb. What about Mary Magdalene? After Peter and John came, they witnessed, they left, they went home. Mary Magdalene hung around and she went again and looked in again and looked to see because early on we see that she came and saw the stone rolled away she didn't go in the tomb she went to get Peter and John so now she goes and she looks in and what does John tell us happened there were two angels sitting there clothed in white I said what you looking for and she says I'm looking for my Lord I'm looking for Jesus where have they taken him and then she turns around and there's a man not too far just a few steps from her so she doesn't recognize him right then and thinks he's just the gardener. And he's like, hey, what's, what's going on? You looking for somebody? <laughs> Here I am. You looking for somebody? And I said, well, and she says, hey, if you've taken my Lord, just tell me where he is and I'll come get him. And I love, just all they had to say was one word at that point. Mary. Like, in that word, like, Mary, it hadn't been that long. Don't you recognize me? Mary, come on. you got to recognize my voice. Mary, this guy that she thought was just the gardener just said, Mary. And immediately she recognized her Lord. And, and you know what? Again, proof, I think, that Peter and John didn't get it. Well, they went home. But what happened with Mary? Verse 18, Mary Magdalene, after she recognized Jesus, after she spoke with Jesus, verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. You see, Mary believed in the risen Savior in that moment. She said, I've seen him, I've spoken to him. Peter and John went home after they believed that the body had been taken. And so in our text, we see the empty tomb there. We see the confused disciples. But then, and this is key, this is, this is the whole point. This is, this is everything right here. Let's look then at the risen Lord. The, the tomb was not empty because the body of Jesus had been stolen. It was, because, it was empty because Jesus had gotten up. Jesus Christ who had died on that cross I mean there was no doubt some have said well maybe he just passed out on the cross and so he woke up in the tomb no he was dead uh, again remember who was doing the crucifixion these were the Roman soldiers this is what they did no doubt some of these guys enjoyed their job and they wanted to make sure they were the best at it and so if they crucified someone and they said yep they're dead they were dead uh, we, we mentioned last week how that uh, they would break the legs to make sure that those that were on the cross would die more quickly. But when they reached Jesus, said he's already dead. But just to confirm, they took that spear and they put it through his side. Where well, we read that blood and water flowed out. I did a little reading on that this week because someone had asked me about it. And the idea is that, uh, you know, there's this, there's this, and again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm just explaining it the best that I can based on what I read. But there's this, this sack around the heart, the lungs, the major organs. There's this sack of fluid to protect them. And when they stabbed him in the side, it says that blood and water flowed. They, they had punctured the sack, the protective sack. And when they did that, it wasn't just blood that came out. It was the water, too. They had gone all the way to the lungs, all the way to the heart. He was dead. There was no doubt in anybody's mind. And so when Jesus got out of that tomb, it wasn't because he just happened to wake up. and like, whoa, that was rough. I got to get out of here. No, when he woke up, it was because he had been dead and he came back to life. And the stone was rolled away, and he walked right on out. You see, Jesus rose from the dead. He did exactly what he said he would do, and exactly the timing that he said he was going to do. He rose on the third day. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. The devil could not defeat him, and sin could not corrupt him. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ 
arose. You see, the resurrection was the culmination of the redemption process. The resurrection was the completion of the gospel story. It is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Without the resurrection, the story is not complete. But Jesus arose and he walked out victorious out of that grave. You know what we see as we looked in chapter 20 here? We see the risen Savior as he revealed, as he revealed himself, first of all, to Mary Magdalene in the garden. We see him as he revealed himself to the disciples in verses 19 through 23. And notice what he said. <clears throat> notice what he said to the disciples there. Twice, when, in, when he went into the room, he talked to them twice, he said, Peace be unto you. Can you imagine the turmoil that they had been living in those last few days? The anguish, the weeping, the mourning, just the, the hopelessness. Now what? We've given the last three and a half years of our lives to following Jesus. Now what? He's dead. And so when Jesus comes and he says, peace be unto you. And then again, he says a few verses later, peace be unto you. He said the very thing they needed to hear. They needed to witness his resurrection and they needed to hear, be at peace. I'm reminded of another time he told them to be at peace. In chapter 14 of John, verse 27, he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace give I unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, troubled neither let it be afraid. Verse 27. Back in verse 21, it said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. He had just told them, I'm leaving. I've got to go away. He had told them the details. I'm going to die. I'll raise again on the third day. And in verse 27 of chapter 14, be at peace. And in chapter 20, they're in turmoil. And so he comes back and he reminds them, peace. Be unto you. My peace. Not the peace like the world gives. Not the peace that the Pharisees promise. Not the peace that uh, money promises. Not the peace. My peace. That's what you need. The peace of a risen Savior. How important is it that Christ rose from the dead? It's infinitely important. It's literally everything. Consider what Paul said about this in 1 Corinthians 15. As a matter of fact, I preached on Easter. I don't remember. Sometime in the last couple of years, I preached a message from this passage entitled, If. And here's what Paul said. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 through 19. And if Christ be not risen... Then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable." It's like if Jesus, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead and all of our faith is based around Jesus dying and rising and if he didn't actually do it, then we're in trouble. Our faith is in vain. We're all still in our sins. We are all miserable. But Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop with the if. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep? There's no question for Paul. There's no doubt for Paul. There's no wiggle room. He said, now is Christ risen? When Mary Magdalene heard that voice, Mary, you know what she said? Now is Christ risen? When the disciples were in that room and Jesus showed up and he said, hey guys, be at peace. Peace be unto you. Then is Christ risen? They had no doubt in that moment that Christ was alive. He had risen. He was there in front of them. Christ is risen. It's the risen Lord who is the source of our hope, our peace, our salvation. It is because of his rising from the dead that we can say with Peter in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You see, Jesus is the only one who could die for the sins of mankind and raise again on the third day victorious over death, sin, and the grave. 
Last week I said, behold the Lamb, as we looked at Jesus on the cross, behold the Lamb. This week I say, behold the risen Lord. Behold the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who stepped out of that tomb of his own power. Listen, the last few weeks have been dark. As we've studied, Jesus arrested, betrayed, denied, tortured, crucified. Oh, these, dark, these days have been dark. These, these passages have been sad. It's broken our hearts, all that Jesus went through. And how could Judas betray him? How could Peter deny him? How could the chief priests and Pharisees want him dead? How could Pilate give in? How could, why, why, why? And it's been dark. But as dark as those days were, even more bright is the, is the light of the salvation that he brings because he rose again. Is John chapter 20 gives us a reason to shout and to share the good news. Jesus is alive. We serve a risen Savior. His songwriters have written so many great things, so many songs about the risen Savior. My words fail compared to what they said. And so we see that Jesus is alive. For those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, I want to remind you again, as I have at different times, Sometimes we get used to our salvation. And we say, well, I've been saved a while, and it's just kind of whatever. Jesus saved me, and you know, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm born again, whatever. Like, it's no big deal. Well, you know, I mean, hey, he's lucky to have me. He owed me. He, you know, he got a good deal when he got me. And then we may not say those things, but we act that way. Good for him. Hey, listen. We ought never to get used to, comfortable, take for granted our salvation. It should always bring us joy, bring us peace, and get us excited when we talk about it. So when we see here that our Savior got up, got up, and got out of that grave, that ought to light a fire inside of all who have called on the name of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because that call that you made, calling on Him, it's only good because He got out of the grave. If not, then you're miserable, and you don't even know it. So... As we're reminded of our risen Savior, let it be a, a fire that is lit or relit within us. A, a burning desire to tell others about our risen Savior. But maybe today, there's some here who have never given their life to Christ. They've never trusted Jesus as their Savior. You've never received Him as your Lord and Savior. I, I want to tell you again, God loves you. And we see that throughout the New Testament, throughout the Bible. God loves you. In the New Testament, we find out that God, it says that he loved you so much that he sent his son to take your place. He loved you so much that he died even when you were in your sins. That's how much he loved you. Because he wanted to make a way for you. God loves you. And so Jesus, the son of God, died a horrible death in your place to pay for your sins. He took your punishment so that you don't have to. However, in salvation, you and I do bear a responsibility. We have to receive that payment. Jesus paid it all. Now we need to accept the payment. Paul said that what we have to do is we have to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And believe in our hearts. Did he say believe in your hearts that he died? Believe in your hearts that he was buried. He said believe in your hearts that God hath raised him from the dead. You see, the resurrection is the key to it all. Without the resurrection, Jesus is just a man who made some claims and then he died and it was over. But with the resurrection, he is the son of God, risen with power, risen with salvation, risen to save us from our sins. We simply have to call on him and receive that payment. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you so much. That we serve a risen Savior. Those who have placed their faith in you, may we all recognize that this is not something that we need to get used to, something we need to take for granted, something that we need to, to just view as an ordinary, everyday event that's not a big deal. Lord, may we that are, have placed our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior recognize today that it is the greatest thing that could ever happen to us. And, and that it is something that we do not deserve. It is a free gift of yours that you have given to us. We simply had to call on you. And Lord, we thank you for that. May it be something that we want to share with others. May we not just head back to our homes today, having witnessed the risen Savior, but may we want to go and tell others. May we want to let everybody know that we serve a risen Savior, even as Mary did when she recognized who Jesus was. Lord, if there be one here today that's never trusted Jesus as their Savior, may today they recognize, you know what, that one that died for me, 
The one who was buried and the one who got up from that grave. He did that for me. And Lord, I want, I want to receive him as my Savior. I want him, I want to accept the payment that he made on my behalf. Please save me. I believe that he died, was buried, and rose again. Lord, if there's one here today that's never been saved, I pray that today they would recognize their need for a Savior and they would give their life to Christ. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in these next few moments of invitation. Have your will, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.